Coming up next on Small Town Big Deal. We're taking you out to a wiffle ball game for this episode of Small Town Big Deal. Then, we find the newest Budweiser Clydesdales in mid-Missouri, 23 and more on the way. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Just northeast of Burlington, Vermont, is the small town of Essex. And just on the outskirts of Essex? Lives a man who has built his own little field of dream. But you're going to find out why it's a really big deal. Meet Pat O'Connor. This guy loves baseball. In 2001, Pat built a wiffle ball field in his backyard. He named it Little Fenway. Soon after, he opened it up to charity tournaments, and it became so popular, he built a second field in 2007, Little Wrigley. We met up with Pat to find out more about his story. My wife and I put an invitation out that said, if we build it, will you come uh, for a 4th of July party to open up Little Fenway? About 200 showed up, and then half of those people wanted to invite more people. <laughs> so we had a marathon wiffle ball game going, and it was really at that moment that we realized that the fields were going to be something a lot more special than what we originally envisioned. Pat is a hero to all the wiffle ball guys, but to me, the hero is his wife, Beth. I've just learned to trust those ideas that, that usually they're going to turn out great. Here's the pitch. a vague memory of playing wiffle ball as a kid a little bit but not like they do here we created kind of a new version of wiffle ball here where we actually play it much like baseball where you run the bases and um, there's a speed control and stuff like that just like when I'm driving a car there's a radar gun here too and you can't go over 35 mile an hour here everybody can play yeah. it kind of levels the playing field for kids and girls and men and women can all um, enjoy this game. Oh my gosh, there's no way I could have hit that. What was that? That is amazing. Rodney and I agreed we had never seen pitches like this before, so we went to the Yankees pitcher Joe to find out how they do it. So I might be a premier pitcher, but I'm also one of the one of the more seasoned. Uh, seasoned, I like that. Yeah, yeah. experience. Yeah. So they were like, well, we're, you know, we know all about yeah, experience. Yeah, we know about seasoned yeah. experience. Yeah. All, yeah. Okay. all that good all stuff. Right. If you would teach us one pitch, which one would you want to teach us? Well, I could let you make the choice. I mean, I have the roundhouse curve, I have a riser, I have a screwball, and a knuckleball. The one that goes best with somebody who throws like a girl. Wow. <laughs> Boy. Jen and I, you know, we're kind of novice wiffle ball players, but, but this is a science to Joe. You're going to bring it, and when you throw it, you're going to kind of like fling it and let it, let it roll off your fingers, if you can. How he taught us to hold the ball and to throw it and spin it. And if you throw it straight like that and, and it starts to spin straight, it's going to curve. He is really good. You're going to make them fear you like this. So you're going to shake oh, the I'm ball. Oh, I'm going to make them yeah, fear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at it like this, okay? Do I growl or anything? Yeah, this is wiffle ball. Come on. Okay. People, people don't realize how serious a, a sport this is. Just do it. No. Did no, you see that? That was that excellent. Was good. It was? I can't believe it worked. I think Joe knows what he's talking about. Come on, right over this place. Right over the play? <laughs> That's right, right over that place. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> this tournament isn't just about the love of the game. It's also about the love for a very special man. That man would be Travis Roy. The reason he's here today is because of a tragic moment in 1995. I was injured in the fall of 1995. I was a freshman at Boston University. It was my first game. Uh, they were the defending national champions. I had been working my whole life for this moment. And I skated in there just as fast as I could. And uh, the defenseman picked up the puck and I thought I'd 
give him a big shoulder check and kind of make my presence known. And, and, I, and I just didn't hit him as squarely as I had hoped and, and went head first into the dashboards. And then turned out I broke my fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae. And, and I'm a quadriplegic ever since. I imagine it's been a, quite a journey from that moment to this day. I've gotten to see the best of humanity. Every day since my accident for 17 and a half years, people are early on were doing things to help me out personally, financially, emotionally, and then eventually we thought we need to, we need to share this goodwill that we keep, keep pouring in, and we started the Travis Roy Foundation uh, to try to help others and, uh, who weren't receiving the publicity or the, um, the help that they needed. Travis admitted he's had some dark days, and I just think that shows he's human. But through the help and support of friends and family, he has really found a greater purpose. How many people would you help a year then with that million dollars? Half the money we raise goes towards research, and the other half goes towards individual grants. I mentioned the wheelchairs, voice-activated computers, um, simple home modifications. It's amazing what can be done um, with a disability if you've got the right technology. What advice do you have for people who don't know how to approach you? The most important thing you can do if you see some of the disability, maybe they're just a little bit different, look them in the eye, put a smile on your face, and say hello. It, it, it just breaks down such a little barrier there that, that lets that person with a disability know that, that you have some level of comfort um, and that and then you're open and accepting to them. Pat and Travis got connected in 2002 when Pat read Travis's book called 11 Seconds. He then offered up Little Fenway as a place to hold charity tournaments to benefit the Travis Roy Foundation. And we raised $4,000 the first year and, and we were thrilled. This is the 12th year of the tournament and they have grown in size, players, teams, and in how much money they've raised. In the end, we're gonna raise over half a million dollars uh, in, in this one weekend. A half a million dollars for wiffle ball? That's awesome. Yeah. We have to take a short break, but coming up next, Rodney and I take a swing at being the home run champ. I don't know, Jan. I'm, I'm not sure which bat to use. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We're in Essex, Vermont at the Travis Roy Foundation Wiffle Ball Tournament, and the competition is fierce. This may be for a good cause, and everybody's having fun, but I'm telling you, these guys are competitive. Rodney and I were invited to compete against each other in a home run derby. So we got two heavy hitters, Eric and Dan, to give us some lessons. All right, uh, Dangerfield, first thing. <laughs> He's already nicknamed me. Grip and rip, as soon as they got there. Okay, grip and rip. That's it, that's how we do it over here. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to get these fancy green socks here. Oh. Right, that's the 30 for 30 club. Oh. We're all here about raising money, so we want to do that. Softball, baseball, they're coming in straight. Wiffle balls, they go any way. Anticipate before the curve is coming in. How long have you been playing? This is my fourth year down here. Wow. Yeah. You love it? I love it. Watch it come in and then flip. Yep, just flip it over. And that's it. That's how you win. Woo! That was great! Did you see that? That was great. Did you see that? <laughs> Jan always thinks she's not athletic, but she really is. And she really hits the ball well in wiffle ball. Now coming up in Little Fenway is the home run at Derby with small town big deal. Now it's Jan Carl and... I was always the last one picked in PE for softball. Jan! I don't play! Yes, you do now. <laughs> so I was a little worried about embarrassing myself. Come on, Jan, keep your eye on the ball. Let's go now. Very good. Yay! I think this may be her sport. Good job, Jane. Good contact. <laughs> Woo! Thank you very much, Jan. Well done. Even though I hit the second one pretty good, I wish I'd had just a little more practice. Now, no roundhouse sinker. Whoa, danger! Ready, danger field. There you go. No, you can't give him the sign of the roundhouse sinker. I really like the Yankees. I've changed my mind. I'm a Yankee fan. What can I say? I tried a few right-handed. Then I switched to left, and I was much more effective. Oh! 
think I'm going to stop while I'm ahead. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Rodney knew how to represent small town big deal. Well, neither of us actually hit home runs, but we did have a lot of fun trying. Jack Coral and Rodney Miller. Now we'll watch the real champs play as the championship game has finally arrived. The Crusaders versus the Boston Beef. Oh, I last out loud. These guys are not playing for money. They're playing for the bragging rights that are etched in stone. Lift it out into a shortstop comes home. And the winner is the Boston Beef. Third time etched in stone. As we wrap up our time in Vermont, it's been great to see how Pat and Travis, both men with different dreams, came together to make a difference in this world. In life, there's times when we choose our challenges. There's other times when the challenges simply choose us. It's what we do in the... Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, Boonville, Missouri has a lot of big deals. Located halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City. Like Daniel Boone's sons helped settle this area. And there are over 400 historic places on the National Registry. Wow. And you know, but the really big deal here, Jan, and I know you're going to love this, is living, breathing, and weighs in at almost 2,000 pounds. That is big. By now, you figured out we're talking Clydesdales, but not just any Clydesdales. We're talking the world-famous Budweiser Clydesdales. And we're talking a lot of them. Here at Warm Springs Ranch in Boonville, there are 98 of them. Make that 99 and more on the way, because this ranch is the official breeding facility for all the Budweiser Clydesdales. It's a 340-acre ranch that has 14 miles of white fencing, 10 pastures, each with their own shelter, and a humongous barn. John Soto is the breeding supervisor, and he's been working with the Budweiser Clydesdales for 33 years. What is it you love about breeding these animals? Oh, it's, I mean, in a way, it's what's not, what's not to love. Um, I mean, it's the Budweiser Clydesdales. John told us that every birth is a whole new experience, and he spends a lot of time picking just the right mare to go with just the right sire, but they never know if it's going to come out looking like a Budweiser Clydesdale. Do you have any idea how many babies you have brought into the world? I'm guessing probably 400, 450 at this point. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh. We should have brought a box of cigars. So you're quite the midwife. The midwife. That's what a lot of people say. So what are you? Are you a vet? No, no. What are you? I'm, I'm a midwife. A Budweiser Clydesdale must be bay in color and have a black mane and tail, four white socks, and a white blaze on their nose. The foals that don't have those characteristics are usually just sold to the general public. We have anywhere from 30 to 45 babies a year. I mean, we're always shooting for around 40. That's a lot. That keeps you busy. <laughs> yeah. Jan and I got up close to those babies and their moms and were amazed how comfortable they were around us. I'm really having a good time out here. But Jan's just having a great time. <laughs> they were also very curious. Oh, <laughs> and a little <laughs> mischievous. I don't know if I could turn my back on you. <laughs> but cute beyond words. They are magnificent. And their personality is so fantastic. Yeah. Of course, if I lived here, I'd my probably be pretty, I'd be pretty happy too. <laughs> yeah. So much here at Warm Springs Ranch is impressive. But one of those things is how John makes sure he is at every birth. Once they get within 30 days of, of having the baby, we're bringing them into the barn every single night. You're looking to see if there's any changes in the last few hours. And that's when we'll go with a, with a foaling alert. OK, so this is our foal alert. We suture this to the back side of the mare. And if she does to start to foal, um, everything starts expanding. A foot starts coming out. It pops this magnet out. My alarm goes off. Then the auto dialer calls me. Now you get. <laughs> oh, that's perfect! <laughs> that's just too cool. <laughs> John lives on the property and can be down to the barn in about a minute and a half. Foaling season, foaling is never that far from me. You know, so I mean, if I'm in the shower, it's right there. If I'm 
you know, anywhere, if I'm eating dinner, it's in my pocket. It, no matter where I am, that phone, I mean, this, this, I carry it with me wherever. You sleep with it? Oh, yeah, it's right next, right this far from my head. Obviously, the answer to that question was obvious. Of course he has his phone next to his head. When he sleeps, when he eats, when he showers, he's got babies coming. Warm Springs Ranch opened in 2008. Before that, the breeding was done in California. One of the biggest differences here, they give tours to the public. Last year, over 16,000 people visited the ranch. Visitors can get right next to these gentle giants. Today, John put us to work getting Duke ready for his adoring public. Come on, Duke. Welcome to Spa Small Town Big Deal. <laughs> First step, washing those famous white socks. Next, curry comb and vacuum. I don't know if I can reach the top. <laughs> Jan did the soft brush and I got stuck with the tail. <laughs> I sure hope he's never kicked anybody. Okay, buddy. <laughs> nice, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> From Stallion Row to a mare who's about to foal, the tours get to see a lot of the ranch. The highlight of the tour? Yeah, you know, it's the foals. We learned that they come out weighing about 150 pounds, but before you feel bad for the moms, mm, their labor, only five to 10 minutes. Then, at the end of the tour, a photo op with Duke. After the tour, John took us to the stall where a portion of a much-loved Super Bowl ad for Budweiser was shot. It starred one of his fillies that the public named Hope. John admits that, just like in the ad, he has a strong connection to the foals. You know, you do have a feeling of pride because that's, that's what we're, at, we're here to do, and, and, and it, is, it is pretty neat. It's really a good feeling. So, you know, when I did see that commercial, I actually did get a little bit of a lump in my throat, and I thought, this is neat. This is what we do. Since the commercial spotlighted the breeding program, more and more people have signed up for the tours, and the first thing they want to see is Hope. So she and her mom, along with another colt and his mom, are right out front for everyone to see. It's kind of neat, you know, because everyone's like, oh my God, making a big deal over a little Hope, and I mean, she's our, you know, she's our baby right here. <laughs> there really is no doubt how passionate John is about his job and the Clydesdales. As we left, we saw John bringing a mare into the barn for the night and overheard him talking to her. All right, Mama, maybe tonight, maybe tonight. Well, Jan, did you get your horse fixed today? <laughs> Usually, my answer to that question is no, there can never be enough horses, but I, I might have. And Travis Roy, is he an amazing guy? And the Travis Roy Foundation and all they do. It's amazing. And Pat, who knew if you build a couple of wiffle ball fields that you could make half a million dollars in one weekend? Hey, if you build it, they will come. And do good. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. We also hope you will go to our Facebook page, like us, and follow us. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when, once again, we celebrate the great stories from across America. Lives a man who has built his own little field of dream. <laughs> but you're about to find out why what, what, it's a... What? Huh? What? What? You started laughing. I just chuckled. I'm sorry. Oh, I so, thought I did something wrong. You're like... <laughs> no, I was just like adding a little uh, chuckle. Did, did I... I like the chuckle. Yeah, I did too. Okay, Chuckles. Now you have a new nickname. <laughs> All right, Dangerfield. So, so the first thing you want to do is uh, Dangerfield. Dangerfield. Yeah, Rodney. First That's thing you my want nickname now. <laughs>